everyone. I'm Steve Schwartz of the LSAT blog, and today I'm very excited to be chatting with UD, a current student at Columbia. How are you doing, UD? Doing well. How are you? Great, great. Thanks for joining me today. I was really interested to speak with you because I noticed that you're at Columbia Law, but your LSAT score increase was not necessarily what people typically end up getting when they go to Columbia Law. If I remember correctly, you went from like a 158 to a 162. Is that correct? Um, yeah, that's, that's, um, yeah, that's correct. So that's great. That's a, a score increases are always excellent, and that's a, a good number of points there. But I'm wondering if there was something else about your application that may have stood out, if there's something you did with the law school mission process in general that you think may have helped your chances and gotten you into Columbia. Could you share a bit about that? Yes, um, of course. I think that a lot of people underestimate the other aspects of the application um, outside of the LSAT and GPA. And what I wanted to do was make sure that every aspect of my application um, was memorable and so I put a lot of effort into my personal statement and a lot of effort into my diversity essay and I tried to make them as unique as possible so for instance with my personal statement I had a very strong um, story of how human rights issues relate to my family because I was interested in international human rights law and my family's from Nigeria and um, had experienced several human rights issues and then I transitioned into my past experiences working at a foundation um, that worked that gave grants to different human rights organizations and I actually tailored my personal statements to each individual school um, so while I had one generic template um, I tailored it with specific um, professors and courses and um, clinics that I appealed to me at every school that I applied to to make it obvious that I had done research about the individual school um, and with my diversity essay, I did the same thing in terms of telling a story about my experiences um, coming from a historically black college. Um, I went to Howard University and how that shaped my activism and how that makes me cherish and value diversity at institutions. So I think those things really helped me stand out. Awesome. So it sounds like you really structured your essays very carefully and put a lot of thought into them. When you say that you worked hard on them, can you tell me more? Like, how many drafts did you do? Did you show them to other people? How long was your rough draft? How many did you go through? What was the process like for you? Yeah, it was a very tedious process. I know that I, I, at least 10 different drafts for each of them. Um, and I also spoke to, I made sure that I had edits from my close friends that are like used to my writing, um, as well as people that were already in law school that I would reach out to just on LinkedIn um, that had similar interests and, you know, have informational interviews with them that would help inform my essays about the schools, but also ask them if they were willing to look over my personal statement when it was done. Um, and then in addition to that, I had most of my recommenders also look at my essays. So um, at there must have been at least 15 eyes on each of them. <laughs> and even when I thought I was done the process at the very end, one of my recommenders thought that I should redo one of my paragraphs. So even up until the end, I was constantly edit editing and constantly changing until I felt like every single word had been looked at by at least five different eyes. Oh, wow. So that, that shows a lot of initiative. You actually went and contacted random people on LinkedIn, people you never met before, but they were alums. Right. And you scheduled informational interviews and just tried to establish a connection with them. Right. And then you eventually, even some of those people reviewed your essays. Yep, that's correct. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm really um, impressed by that. I, lo I love that you went beyond, even if you don't know anybody, even if you're not hiring an admission consultant, there are still clearly some things you could do here. Yes, for sure. I think people don't think, think about the biggest resource in terms of whether or not finding information about individual schools are the current students and the, and the most recent alum. And most of the times I found they were very, very willing to talk to in prospective students, um, especially if you like look into their background and find some kind of connection with them. Um, and yeah, they were more than willing to look at one of, one of my a friend of a friend who was a recent alum from Harvard Law School, he actually went through my essay like multiple times, same with somebody I met randomly on LinkedIn at NYU. So they actually went above and beyond what I even anticipated. Wow, that's incredible. So clearly you're ambitious, you have a lot of initiative, but for someone watching this who may be a little more shy or a little nervous, what exactly do you put in an email like that? I know you may not have the email in front of you, it's been a while, but just give us a brief like rundown of what do you say to someone you're contacting randomly? Oh, I saw you're also proficient in Microsoft Word. Because <laughs> what, what do you say to them? Where do you find that common ground? 
Well, sometimes a lot of the people that I initially reached out to when I was more shy were people that were already featured on the school's website in some way. Um, they were either listed as an example of someone who's received some kind of award or participated in a particular program. So it was easy for me to say, hi, my name is UD. While I was on, you know, Insert University's website, I happened to stumble upon your um, recent award in XYZ. I think that's really fascinating. And then I would pivot to me, like I'm a prospective student thinking of applying this cycle with interest in international human rights. And I would love to hear and speak, hear more about your experience at the school. Um, and um, yeah, that was pretty, pretty generic. Um, but um, I kept it short and sweet and I would just follow up from time to time if there were particular people I was really interested in talking to. Wow. That sounds, that sounds great. I would definitely recommend anyone watching this to try and, and simulate what you did, UD, because I think it could really have an impact and it's something that most people don't even think of doing. Yes, for sure. And also professors as well. Um, although you have to be kind of careful um, because um, I think in regards to Harvard, I know I ended up getting an email from Harvard, like, okay, like you've contacted too many professors um, <laughs> from Harvard admissions um, because I just, you know, professors in areas that I would love to take classes in, you, I was also surprised at how willing, or, or specific professors that ran clinics that I was interested in, speaking to them about how, what was unique about their clinic, or how human, international human rights was taught within their school, and, you know, I would have, the thing with professors is to be sure to have more targeted questions, because you don't want to waste their time. Um, and then I would then go to my personal statement for the school and be able to insert a sentence like after speaking with Professor so and so about how this is, you know, some unique element of their human rights clinic, for instance. Um, it, it, I think that also strengthened my, my essays because you could see that I had already done the work and it also helped strengthen my interviews as well. Right. So really showing that you've done the homework on each individual school, contacting professors and alums, and you can work that in to your essays as well. Right. Right. Now, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the LSAT, because I know that you were studying for the LSAT for a while. Maybe you postponed your test date multiple times, I think you said, right? I postponed my test date one time, and then I retook it after that time. Okay. And so how long would you say you studied for the LSAT overall? I studied, so I studied from April until June, and then I decided to postpone my LSAT. Um, and then I studied from June until September and took the first one, and I studied from September to I believe the next LSAT date was in in October. So um, yeah, so altogether, however many months that is, um, it was pretty long amount of time. So maybe six months, something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah, six months is actually, I think, a good amount of time to study overall to invest in this process. I think your situation doesn't really sound that unique to me. I talk with a lot of students who are postponing and retaking and they think, when is this gonna end, the LSAT, you think it's like the SAT at first and then it's so much more than that, right? Right, exactly. It's, it's a whole different beast. Would you say that um, in terms of materials, did you use a lot of real LSAT prep tests? Yes. Um, that was one of the pieces of advice I had gotten pretty early on in the process from people who had gone through. Um, and I had heard that you know, certain test companies or certain books um, don't necessarily use real LSAT. Um, exam. So that was something that was really important to me that I made sure I was only studying from past LSAT um, exams. Um, one question that I have in particular that I found many people asking me, and I'm definitely not an expert on the LSAT, is what do you do when, you know, you've been studying, whether it's for six months or less than that, and you just feel like you're hitting a wall and you can't, you don't see any like score increase or improvement? What would you recommend? Yes, yeah, score plateaus are really common and they're really frustrating, of course. Sometimes it feels like you could be reviewing book after book and gaining new insights, but then you're not actually able to apply them in the real world test day conditions. So I think there's a disconnect sometimes from studying under untimed conditions versus timed. Right. It's not just enough to get the questions right. You have to get them right quickly and efficiently in the time allotted. And so I think what you've got to do there is work on your pacing. Let's say logical reasoning, 35 minute sections. You have about 25 questions in that section, but not all questions are of equal difficulty. So you could try to blast through the first 10 questions in 10 to 12 minutes. Then you build up a time bank that you could apply to the tougher questions later in the section. And if you come across a handful of questions you don't understand, 
maybe three or four or even six, you mark them off, you flag them, you come back to them at the end of the section. You don't want to get bogged down. And so applying strategies like this and finding pacing techniques that work for you is sometimes what can make the difference going from untimed to timed and getting those score breakthroughs. Another thing that often is a problem with score plateaus is you don't understand why you're getting things wrong. You just get them wrong. You measure your results. You're happy you're sad about the results, maybe more likely sad since you're still studying. And then you have to look at in depth, excruciating detail, what was tempting about the wrong answer that made you pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong. And then what is discouraging about the right answer that pushes you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. You want to do this again and again and again, even writing out by hand or typing, yet really articulating your thought process. That's the only way that you can actually make gains in understanding from the work that you're putting in. It's not enough to just take exam after exam. I do want students, anyone taking this, to take the exam at least 10 practice tests under real simulated conditions. But taking them isn't enough. The review process is equally, if not more, important. Right. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you for that. Yeah, of course. My pleasure. In terms of a study plan, I would say, again, three to six months minimum of studying. I think that if you can get even just a few more points from retaking, it's worth it. Like your study journey, UD, like you did improve a couple of points. Maybe it wasn't what you'd hoped, right. but any increase, especially if you're going from the 150s to the 160s or 160s to 170s, that number, that extra 10 in the middle digit actually has a real psychological impact. And no one's immune to that, law school admission officers included. So 159 to 160 or 169 to 170, there is something more to it than just a single point. Right. But ultimately with law school admissions, everything is numbers. And so while personal statement, diversity statement, addenda, LORs, those have an impact, at the end of the day, the numbers do have the biggest impact. And I'm not saying that's right or fair, but that is just how it is. The law schools, they care about their rankings more than anything else. Their the uh, jobs, the careers of the admission officers are based on how their schools do in their rankings. It's a crazy numbers-driven thing. And so if you can get your score even just a few more points, you could get into a better law school or get thousands in scholarship money or both. And the ROI on that is huge. So it is worth putting in the time, even if you're not feeling like you're making gains, just see maybe there's another resource, maybe another book or video course or instructor, something you could seek out that could help you gain those valuable insights that will help you turn your practice test scores into real world test day scores that have an impact. Yeah, that, that all makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, of course, you do. Any other questions or insights I could share before we sign off for now? Yeah, um, I just had a question in regards to what you, your last statement um, about numbers. Um, I, I, would, I always try to tell the people on my page, while numbers are definitely not going to downplay the importance of numbers, um, to if they hit a plateau or um, have taken it more than one time, um, to just try to emphasize every other aspect of their application. Because I think that numbers in all respects matter. So numbers in terms of the, I know for instance, Columbia, um, they might have a percentage of students that typically go into a particular field and they're trying to diversify um, that as well. And so um, one question I have to you is, if someone's retaken it, the exam once, how many times would you suggest retaking the LSAT without it being a detriment to their application? That's a great question, UD. I think that there are too many people who take the exam five, six, seven times over a period of a couple of years, and it starts to look a little nuts, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. But taking it two or three times, or even four times, I would say is okay, depending on the situation and the student's particular timeline. So if taking it yet again would make you delay by an entire year, and you just really want to be done with this and move on with your life, that's okay. Listen, it's, it's ultimately up to you at the end of the day. And you may have family considerations or career considerations that are unique to you and require just applying and being done with it. So I would say overall, probably three or four times max mm -hmm. is what I would say. If you have like three scores on your record and one cancellation, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But unless you can see a different way of prepping that's going to have a major impact on your score, 
then it could be time to shift gears and focus instead on the other parts of the application. LSAT and GPA are the biggest components by far, mm -hmm. but if you're not making headway on the LSAT and you've put in time after time, massive effort, invested money, resources, commitment, et cetera, and it's just not clicking for you, then yes, switch gears, focus on the personal statement, the addenda, the LORs, do the sort of networking that you discussed, UD. I think that that was a great idea. LinkedIn, alums, professors, et cetera. You can make those parts as strong as you possibly can. And hey, whether you have a great LSAT score or not, or a great GPA or not, you should still do all that stuff anyway. You have nothing to lose and only to gain. So I think that should be the recommendation, the techniques that you used, UD, I think are absolutely essential for anyone who wants to maximize their chances, whether the LSAT is doing it for them or not. Right, I definitely, I completely agree. <laughs> All right, UD, Will. thanks for connecting today. It was a real pleasure speaking with you. I think we shared some good insights for the law school applicants. And for those watching on my channel, is there a particular video I should point them towards? Um, I would say, I just would love for you to just link any of like your more, your more popular videos um, that happen to be popular amongst um, your audience. Oh, in, on my channel, um, I would definitely recommend my first video um, about numbers because I cover not only LSAT, but also G, uh, GRE and um, GPA as well. Okay, awesome. I will link them to that. And then on your, on your channel, for those watching on your channel, I will send you a few links to include for games, reasoning, and reading comp, and then step schedules in general. Okay. It was great awesome. connecting with you, UD. Thanks so much for doing this and let's be in touch. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.